Hello and welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO of JJ Recruitment, specialist HR recruiters. And today it's a fantastic day because we are celebrating International Women's Day, which is all about commemorating the cultural, political and socioeconomic achievements of women. Hence, I am delighted to welcome today's guest, Rachel Gilfin, who is a confidence and career coach. She works with ambitious women to grow their confidence and propel their careers. Now, believe it or not, International Women's Day has been observed since 1911. And the day marks a celebration of women, encouraging people to come together and campaign for gender equality. Last year, the UN theme for the uh, International Women's Day was Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. And this year, the theme is Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow. Well, Rachel, who joins me today, works with women on developing confidence in all areas of life. But she also works with businesses to improve and support gender diversity in the workplace. Now, you may or may not be aware, but recent data published on only February 22nd of this year shows now that nearly 40% of UK FTSE 100 board positions are now held by women, compared to just 12.5% just 10 years ago. Rachel is helping the UK to continue this trend. In fact, she's developed a corporate group coaching program specifically designed for women to grow in confidence and in communication skills to help them feel empowered to proactively co-create their career path with the organisations they work for. She's going to tell us all about her three key pillars for success that inspire and shape her work, mindset, confidence and communication skills. So without further ado, welcome Rachel Gilfin to the HR L&D podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm great. Thanks so much for that fantastic introduction, Nick. I'm so pleased to be here. Super, super stoked to have you on the podcast today on such a fantastic day of celebration. Before we jump into International Women's Day, though, I'm just going to ask you the first question that I ask all my guests on the show. What do the words human resources mean to you? Well, I think human resources, you know, everybody that makes up an organization, you know, is human and they have all sorts of different areas within their life that they need support and development with. And so the human resources department is just so fundamental in keeping that machine whirring, keeping, you know, everyone ticking around in the way that they should be and really maximizing their potential. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Now, funnily enough, I read on your website that something that helped shift your perspective when you were once lacking confidence was listening to lots of different podcasts. I'm hoping this HR L&D show is helping others who are listening right now as well. Fingers crossed. I'd love, though, if you can just tell us a little bit more about your shift uh, for yourself and in that mindset, really, that helped inspire you to launch Rachel uh, Harriet, that Rachel Harriet coaching business. Yeah, of course. I think really for me, at the time I was working within my corporate role, which was in the technology industry, and I was really keen to kind of really begin to move forward in my career and progress, but I just felt so challenged in being taken seriously and having my voice heard. Um, And the challenges that I was having was that I didn't know how to effectively articulate myself. I knew that there was so much there, but I couldn't really bring it to the surface. And the shift that happened for me when I started to look at, you know, listening to different podcasts and understanding more about mindset was really just this this comprehension of choice and decision. And the fact that we can make a decision to look at things in a way that positively contributes towards a goal or negatively detracts from it. And quite a lot of the time when our minds are on autopilot, what we're listening to is unfortunately limiting beliefs which are detracting from the goal that we're trying to get to. So that yeah. that shift for me that really made me stop and think about the way I could change my approach was definitely all about looking at that decision. There must be people listening to this already, and there's only been a few moments into this podcast, so thinking, oh my God, Rachel was really anxious about being articulate. I mean, you sound so articulate. You've been on so many podcasts. You're now delivering coaching on this very, very subject. So what is it that helps you make that complete sort of 360 mindset shift from someone who was feeling anxious at the time to actually launching a business focused on delivering um, support into the areas, I guess, where you felt initially you had had potential challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. The reason that I wanted to start that business to support other women was because I'd had the challenges. You know, I knew that I had so much more to offer, but I just didn't know how to get there. And I think that the challenges initially in articulating myself were all down to confidence. You know, it was very much about really looking at believing that what I had to share 
was a value. Okay. And when I began working on that confidence, the, the articulation of where I wanted to go and refining my communication skills in line with that all came together really nicely, which I guess, you know, you kind of lean towards this in, in the introduction is where that three pillars come in because it all starts with mindset and then building confidence to look at, okay, actually, you know, maybe I can do this. And then the communication skills can be refined to such a fantastic level to really reach and resonate with people because those other two things are already in place. And for you, I mean, it is International Women's Day today. Clearly that you have a calling to really support women in particular. You've aligned yourself specifically to supporting women. I mean, the first line on your website, which I love, it hits you really straight, straight between the eyes here is, ladies, unlock your potential. It's kind of the first line on your website, which I love. Why in particular, though, do you find that women struggle to be understood or seen at work um, as opposed to, to men or, 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 you know, why, why have you particularly aligned yourself with the, you know, with, the, with the women's cause? Yeah, good question. Well, for me in the technology industry, it was very male dominated. I was, you know, the only woman in the team when I first joined. Okay. And I think that what I learned throughout that process was that in order for me to become successful, I needed to turn up my masculine characteristics and um, to try and fit in with that environment rather than actually embracing some of my feminine characteristics that came more naturally to me. And what I found over the years and the work that I do now is that, you know, particularly women are subjected to a lot of different behaviors, unwelcome behaviors. And some of these common workplace challenges that we have are things like, you know, less access to high profile jobs, lack of senior sponsorship. So if we don't see anybody who is also a woman who has progressed, we just don't believe that's possible for us. And um, there's a lot of things that happen in, you know, workplaces, unfortunately, still, such as microaggress microaggression and microaggressive behavior. And I kind of started to have a look at all these different experiences that women collectively were sharing with me that they were having. And I thought to myself, all of these things, it's, it's sort of behaved as conditioning over the years. And when it comes down to it, they're just chipping away slowly at our confidence so that when yeah. a new role does come up, we don't have the confidence to put ourselves forward as women because there's all this conditioning about what is actually possible for us. So I think that particularly um, almost acknowledging and validating the challenges that women have is almost like a bit of a sigh of relief for them because they think actually, yes, you know, we have been through that. And I think that with organizations, they tend to look at creating a fantastic culture from, from the inside out, which is always great. But what they sometimes don't consider is the fact that this conditioning and this behavior that women have experienced is very likely to have gone on prior to this individual joining their organization. So sure. you can create the best culture or the best environment that you want from that place, but we actually need to acknowledge that there's already some things there um, that have really enhanced how women tend to behave towards career progression. Do you feel, I mean, it's International Women's Day today, so there's gonna be a lot of awareness out there, a lot of celebration, which is great, but you mentioned some words there, microaggressions being one, um, sometimes that just through the amount of time we've become, I think the word you used was conditioned to mm. respond in a certain way. It's great this awareness is happening, of course, and there's going to be loads of celebratory stories, which is fantastic. I'm going to talk about those in just a moment as well, because I think it's good we get both sides to, to that to make sure we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't got to the end game yet. We need to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. But do you think there are potentially going to be people listening to this or certainly people that you work with who aren't even aware that they're necessarily um, sub being subjected to these microaggressions because they've become so conditioned and therefore... Is that another sort of barrier or layer that we need to try and remove so that people are more aware that they're even in this environment? Sometimes people aren't aware they're being abused. Does that make sense? Or, or, or yeah. being overlooked because they haven't looked at it that way or, as you put it, they've been conditioned to such an extent that actually that awareness is almost gone. Are you finding that in the work that you do or do you think there's still a problem there in, in that regard in the UK? Oh, absolutely. I think there is still a problem. I think especially within organisations, um, if the behavior is coming from a specific number of sources, um, what we tend to do is normalize it. So even when speaking with peers or colleagues about the behavior, it's almost joked about or, you know, 
swept under the rug as, oh, well, that's just the way it is. And I think that until we have somebody to say, actually, that shouldn't be the way it is, and that isn't okay, you know, it really takes for that moment of clarity to make you think and reflect back on experiences that you've had and think, actually, no, you know, I shouldn't have put up with that. And I think another thing that's a challenge for people in this situation is they watch or witness other people go through that. So, yeah. for example, they could be in a meeting and um, somebody could speak over someone and kind of just dismiss what they were trying to say. If that person then doesn't react or say anything back, they just, that behavior is normalized. So, what I'm trying to spread the message of as part of International Women's Day is all about calling out that behavior in a way that doesn't feel, you know, confrontational because it doesn't need to be. Sure. It's simply a corrective measure, you know, calling out that behavior and, and calling out the behavior on behalf of others as well, who perhaps don't have the confidence to do that. Because when we start acknowledging it and calling it out, you know, everybody else will begin to notice as well. Yeah, no, perfect. I'm going to to read out some statistics from the recent findings that have been published 22nd of February. Some really, really um, good statistics in here, really progressive statistics. However, I'm going to taint it a little bit because I still think we've got further to go. Um, But Mm -hmm. it is International Women's Day today. And the good news is, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are seeing many organisations doing more than ever before to address gender diversity in relation to leadership roles in particular. And as I mentioned earlier, in the UK, uh, we have climbed to second in the international ranking for women's representation on boards at FTSE 100 level. The new data shows nearly 40% of UK FTSE 100 board positions are now held by women, compared to just 12.5% just 10 years ago. The findings do demonstrate a major sea change in attitudes to getting women leaders to the top table of business in the UK, which is fantastic. And with women's board represent- representations have also increased uh, across not just the FTSE 100, which is now 39.1%, but the FTSE 250, 36.8%, and the FTSE 350, which is 37.6%. However, and we're going to see lots of success stories here, and rightly that we should, and lots of things, the government saying we're doing great work, and we are. However, I want to just sort of put a little underline here. It's really important that we continue to build on this success, that we continue to increase women's representation on boards and in leadership. Because while there has been remarkable progress at boardroom level, still only one in three leadership roles and around 25% of all executive committee roles are held by women. So my question for you today, I guess, Rachel, is this. What do you think is holding back this statistic? And what more can businesses do to really help improve some of these representative numbers? It's an interesting one because quite a lot of the time, the the sort of reasons that organisations tend to cite about why the the balance isn't different is because, you know, some of the reasons could be um, we just don't have that many applicants, you know, from women or you know we don't find that there's that much interest in the moving ahead and i think that quite often what we find is that women do have an interest there but they're waiting for that permission slip so they're waiting for you know somebody either their line manager or somebody from human resources to tell them that they're ready or that okay. they're good enough and i think that the challenge that, that comes there is that they're not going to have the confidence to put themselves forward it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, the, the applicants that they're going to keep getting for these more senior roles won't have as many women there. I think that organizations, communication skills are absolutely key because I'm such an advocate for people staying within the organization and making a career there, which is why I encourage co-creation of that career path within the organization. But so often I think that you know, we see people leaving places or handing their notice in saying, there was just nowhere for me to go. You know, I'd hit a ceiling yeah. effectively. But then the organizations have a totally different view of that. You know, they they say in the exit interview, oh, we, you know, you could have done this, we had that available. But are they actually sitting down with people and, you know, showing them the opportunity that's there? And not only that, are they showing them opportunity that's in a linear career path rather than show, sort of showing opportunities from different departments that could also be suited. And I think that that is one challenge that certainly I experienced. It was only other roles that were kind of directly above. So it would be, you know, 
perhaps my boss's job or his boss's boss's job sure. was the only way that you thought that you could progress. So I think definitely communication skills within organizations about how they can make sure that the platform is there for everybody to apply, you know, is really, really important. I mean, obviously, I couldn't agree more with what you've just mentioned. And obviously, this isn't going to happen overnight. It's great to see that there is a sea change and things are improving. Do you feel, though, that because um, if you use that 25% that number to begin with, if 75% of those boards are still predominantly male, then it's still, the, it's still predominantly males making those decisions. So maybe we all do communicate differently. But is there is there a, a, communi a communication um, issue there between the male boards trying to improve representation potentially or overlooking, or is it more that the, 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 the women who are underrepresented at the minute aren't communicating enough to say they want to progress? Is it a little bit of both? What more can be done now? If we were to fast forward ten years on from now, and we've gone from twelve and a half percent to thirty nine point one percent, what where would you like to see things sat, and what can we do to try and bridge that that communication gap? Um, I think it's a matter of prioritization. You know, so many organizations say, you know, this is where we'd like to be. But if you look at that goal in, in, in this, let's say there's a to-do list, you know, for that organization, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the more commercial decisions will fall a lot higher up on that list than something mm -hmm. like a diverse board. So one of the things that I learned from a Gartner briefing that I, that I recently attended was all about really making some of these diversity calls um, sort of part of people's KPIs. So if you are a leader, if you are on the board, really looking at you know how you can make part of their role as important as some of the other KPIs to look at really helping, you know, is it is it people mentoring people within a business to help them to get those additional skills that they need to even sit in an interview, you know, helping them to look at what other knowledge or skills that they could need to put themselves in that position. Is it, you know, being able to go out there and conduct sessions on, you know, educating them about the benefits of a diverse board? And um, so I think that really making it a priority that's actually linked to remuneration package, because by doing that, you know, I think people's perspectives would shift quite dramatically. Yeah, I know you probably are. Obviously, you're a big fan of mentoring. It's part of what you do in your in your coaching business. You've got a lot of experience in supporting and helping ambitious women, as you mentioned earlier, to reach their potential. And you've highlighted a few times in your website and in your research and things I've read, that actually confidence is often the thing that's holding people back. Confidence is often very low, but you have a process that you've developed that really helps unlock potential to help overcome some of these anxieties. You mentioned your your pillars uh, early on as well. Can you talk us a little bit more about your process, what those three pillars are, uh, which I know it's mindset, confidence and communication, but bringing those to life are really helping. You've worked with some fantastic leaders to, to, to I guess, positively build and, and improve the leadership roles for women and, and the opportunities they have before them. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to perspective. So one of the things that I like to, to talk about with people is viewing situations that they've been in and looking at what their interpretation of that has been and then just offering alternative perspectives towards that because I think that for the mindset element, it's really important for people to get clear on that self-reflection process. So what it is exactly that today they believe and really the reason behind that is because of course what they've believed in the past is what has got them to where they are today but if they can begin to shift that perspective and that mindset to look at okay well potentially this could be available for me each contribution towards that mindset every day will get them closer to that goal and i think that developing that inner trust in knowing actually i do have the choices the decisions to make about you know what i believe is possible for me is fantastic from that personal integrity piece because you know when you say that you're going to do something and you do it and you carry that out the confidence will build naturally as a result of that interesting so how does your process start then would you, would you begin with mindset do you begin with you know historical barriers that are holding people back because i know you've got it, it's a three key stage process and you mentioned earlier yourself that one of your um, I guess inhibiting beliefs was around your ability to articulate, which obviously you've clearly overcome, well, in my view anyway. Um, what would be your process for helping someone who was feeling anxious, was lacking confidence, but actually did have the ambition to get to the top? Yeah, well, in my six week program, we, we always start with the mindset module, which really looks into firstly, what is mindset? And then looks at limiting beliefs. 
really it's all about educating the group that limiting beliefs are something that everybody experiences in one shape form or another so first of all just normalizing that actually some of those thoughts that we have such as i'm not good enough what if i say something stupid you know these thoughts that often come up when we think about leaving our comfort zone and um, just really normalizing those Sorry, Rachel, I lost you again there. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I don't know yeah. whose end it is either. I'm looking at I'm, my internet seems to be on, but anyway, I, I've Mine lost it. Mine looks fine. Yeah, we can we can pick up whether uh, maybe at the start of, of your process, and I'll I'll edit in. No, no one will ever know. <laughs> okay, perfect. So we're still recording now. We're yeah, we're back into recording. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with the mindset module in you know module one out of my six week program, we really look at how we can start to recognize some of the limiting beliefs that come up in our minds. So for example, I'm not good enough. What if I say something stupid? I'm not good enough to go for that promotion. And we help people to acknowledge and normalize the fact that everybody has these thoughts, whether you know, you're an intern in a brand new role all the way through to the CEO. These thoughts do still come up but it's all about how we recognize and reframe these. So I help people with a reframing formula that helps them to look at that situation in a more positive way. So they can really begin to look at how can I reframe this so that it contributes towards my goal rather than the tracks from it. And then once we've really had that self-reflection process and looked at what's been holding us back so far, we look at gently stretching that comfort zone to build confidence bit by bit. Now this can start with anything that's not necessarily linked towards career progression, but just any small steps that you be you can begin to implement to stretch that comfort zone. Um, and the, the formula that I always give as part of that confidence process is looking at what exactly it is that you're, that you're afraid of happening and then building a plan for every scenario that you're scared of. Because of course, our minds are wired to fear or avoid uncertainty. Yeah. What we do within that process is we remove the uncertainty. We make a plan for all of these catastrophes that we're imagining are going to happen if we do leave our comfort zone. And once we've got a plan for everything, it's like, okay, well, I can take the next step now because I know what I'm gonna do. Even if the worst happens, I know what I'm going to do. So building confidence in this way is a very practical way of, getting people to move forward towards their goals, actually trusting in themselves as well. No, that makes sense. Well, I know that uh, the mindset always, or the human mind always wants to take us to the worst case scenario, doesn't it? And actually it's rarely as bad as we think it's going to be, but we create these imaginations in our head and our day-to-day -day conversations in our mind that things might always work out and it makes us anxious. Interesting, again, finding out about you, about your background, Rachel, I know that you had a, a mentor, you had some coaching yourself that led you to where you are. I'm a big believer in mentorship. Um, funnily enough, my, I, and, and also role models. So my, one of, my role model is my mum, who's a great female to mention here on, on Inside Women's Day. But also for those that have heard my podcast in the past or read any of my articles, one of my biggest inspirations for me is Chrissy Wellington, who is, for those not familiar, is an Ironman triathlete. She is phenomenal, wrote one of my favourite all-time books called Life Without Limits, um, which I recommend anyone should read, female, male, or anyone else. You know, you've got to read this book. It's fantastic. But what role do you think mentors can have in helping people to reach their potential? It doesn't necessarily have to be a direct coach, which I know both you and I have, have had and we utilise, but maybe even external role models that, that are in, inspirations to us. What roles do you think they can play in helping someone to, to unlock their potential? A huge role. I mean, I have hundreds of mentors in the, in the way that obviously we've had direct mentoring, as you mentioned, but even people, you know, who podcasts I listen to, I'm learning so much from people every day. And I think, first of all, they almost collapse that invisible gap between where someone's got to and where you think you are. So it's almost show, by showing the process, which is what these mentors are doing, you know, they're sharing the process for, for how they've overcome certain things. It really makes you feel as though actually it's a lot more achievable for me. And it gives you that place to start and really consider another way of going about it. 
Um, and I think that there's so much inspiration to be gleaned from that mentor relationship because you're looking upon that person as somebody who you really respect usually um, and have a lot of time for. So during that time, you're almost giving yourself an hour or, or whatever, however long, you know, that either session is or, or podcast, or whatever, you're giving yourself time to invest in your own sort of mindset and progression. Yeah. Whereas when you're not working with a mentor and you're kind of going through the motions on autopilot, you don't zoom out of the every day. Whereas working with a mentor gives you that time to really think about things differently outside of the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of everything that's kind of getting you down or getting in the way of where you want to be. It's like that look up moment, isn't it? I know there's a whole movement about yeah. this, but looking up, we spend so much time looking down and focused on day to day that sometimes we can forget what's right in front of us or take the time to, especially for the leaders listening to this, take that strategic time to really understand where you want to go and why you want to get there and what your motivations, your, what your why is, I guess. So it's really important yeah. that we do that. Now, I know that often, as well as having a lot of experience in helping ambitious uh, women and going through your three pillars, been very, very successful. You've also got a, a corporate program which is helping women deal with commonplace workplace challenges. What are some of the common workplace challenges that you, you are seeing in the workplace and what are the kind of things can we do to help overcome some of those challenges? Yeah, it's very much around being able to, I mean, the main thing that women come to me and say that they really struggle with um, is speaking up, you know, being able to speak up and share their ideas in an environment where they feel like they're going to be valued. Now, of course, mindset has a lot to do with whether something's valued or not. And the likelihood is in a lot of situations, you know, we feel as though it may not be valued, but that's a confidence thing. Mm. So very much, you know, in terms of common workplace challenges, it's about changing that external perception that somebody else may have of you to show that actually, you know, you do have all the skills and experience and everything to move yourself forward. And I think that, you know, quite a lot of the time when we are looking at career development, there's a lot of frustrations that come up because people will say things like, well, you know, I've done all this and I've done all that, but what they're not doing is sharing that with anybody else. So communication sure. plays such a huge role because we're sat there saying, well, I've done all this, I've done all that, and nobody else knows. So being able to self-advocate for yourself is such an important area in terms of propelling your career that a lot of people aren't doing. So one of the things that I always get people to do who are going through the six-week program is, sounds like a basic thing to do, but learn how to write an elevator pitch. So for any listeners who maybe aren't familiar with this term, it's very much um, an introduction that really talks about the benefits of you, what you're doing and why you're doing it and, and what value you can bring to it. And I usually use the, the example of, you know, when somebody new starts in the office and they get shown around and you sort of swivel around on your chair and say, hi, I'm Rachel and um, work in marketing and yeah, it's great. <laughs> And everybody does the same thing. And we never take this opportunity to say, I'm really passionate about this. I love doing this. And this is the reason why I'm great at my role. So what I want everybody to be able to do is to be able to really pull out all the reasons why they do what they do and they love it and the reasons why they're great at their role. And by practicing introducing themselves in this way, it means that they're almost reaffirming that message to themselves daily, but also changing that, that perception around them and showing that actually they can begin to speak up and move forward in that way. No, I think it's a great, great idea. And it can help you in all facets of life as well, right? Not just not just in the workplace. And um, I guess a lot of it comes from having the confidence to show that passion. People have the passion, as you say, are sometimes afraid to show it or to deliver it for, for fear of, you know, how it's going to be received or, or, or seen. But actually, I think if, if you do anything with passion, it's usually perceived and received well. Um, yeah. Because people if people see you're passionate about something and you care about something, it automatically changes their mindset to go, well, whether I agree or disagree, I'm not really going to get involved in this because it's I'm just going to support it because clearly they're more passionate about this than potentially I am or, or you know, let's just support it. So I think that's <laughs> it's really, really good advice. What would you like to see more organisations do, though, when it comes to creating an environment where women can feel empowered? You mentioned talk, you mentioned about co-creation and creating uh, co-pathing, if you like 
to help their career path. So the other things that you would say now, if there are leaders listening to this, which hopefully there are, who are managing big teams, you know, what can they do to really support women to help them feel more empowered? Um, well, I think there's a few things, you know, we kind of touched on on the conditioning element earlier and about how, you know, we can't assume that because the environment that people are in now is positive, is safe, is supportive, that that means that, you know, that that's translating and that's something that that is helping women to feel empowered. So I think really showing that you understand that people will have had other conditioning, they will have had other experiences in their lives and communicating the fact that, you know, that isn't something that's going to be replicated throughout. Um, another thing on conditioning, which I think that a lot of organizations don't necessarily consider is conditioning from other parties within the organization. So for example, if you've got somebody coming into the team who's worked for an organization previously where they've perhaps the only women in their team have been sort of in admin roles and they're in, you know, client facing roles, for example, the cultures that that person may have absorbed from that place is very much around, you know, passing work on and putting women into that position of supporting them rather than everybody supporting each other equally. So I think constantly when you are onboarding people, making sure that that culture and the way that you are operating is made very, very abundantly clear from the first First, first kind of week of, of them starting really um, and I think as well when we look at you know other examples of sorry that's my dog back. Okay. <laughs> that's <not> my dog <laughs> sorry um, and I think as well you know when we look at um, organizations trying to support more women to get ahead what we tend to see is sort of a, an early adoption within this, um, you know, gender diversity and things like that. And there's a lot of people who are very pro that. And so when you do see people supporting or, you know, advocating for others or trying to sponsor people to get ahead, that's fantastic. But there's other people within the organization that you'll notice that are maybe a little bit quiet and never actually get involved with these sorts of initiatives or never actually volunteer to mentor or just don't necessarily get involved and I think a lot of the challenges that we have is those individuals don't think that any of this applies to them it's like yeah you know I'm not from you know a minority I don't have you know I'm a man who's been in this role forever and I know my path and so many a very high percentage actually of people within organizations just aren't subscribing to understanding more about you know diversity and inclusion as a whole which is a challenge because whilst we can celebrate the progress that we're making with the people who are at the forefront of that there's still these people on the ground who are creating you know an environment that other people are working with them in so not necessarily kind of celebrating the wins that you're having with those early adopters, but really looking at the organization as a whole and noticing which groups of people aren't necessarily getting involved or trying to help towards this goal. Because the people that are probably quieter or not getting involved are probably where that education piece really does need refining. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, I have to mention as well, it's International Women's Day today, you've actually developed a specific coaching course to celebrate today as well and to really help businesses, to help people, you know, both on an individual and corporate basis. Can you tell us a little bit more about your specific um, coaching courses that you're offering now that really do help a, celebrate the, the role that women are having in our, in, in, our, in business in particular and getting to the top, but also helping those that you've mentioned there that might be a little bit quieter, they have a voice, they're just a little bit afraid to find it. So some of the work you're doing specifically to support International Women's Day. Yeah, sure. Well, it's been a super busy last couple of weeks. So I've been conducting uh, one hour women's confidence workshops for organizations um, in celebration of International Women's Day, which has very much been around taking some of the core principles from my six week program. And um, so as some of the things that we've discussed today, really looking at reframing limiting beliefs and really starting to build those building blocks of confidence, which is massively helping and the feedback has been phenomenal for those. Um, and as well, you know, the six week corporate program looks at um, mindset, confidence and communication, of course, my three pillars, but it also takes it a lot further and looks at things like dealing with microaggression, 
being able to speak up in meetings and, and setting boundaries as well, because a lot of what we're seeing within well-being at work, so many people are kind of citing feelings of, you know, burnout, overwhelm. And I think a lot of that comes from um, you know, not being able to moderate our responsibility within the organization. So women do tend to be people pleasers and we do tend to take on more than we probably ought to because we want to be seen to be going over and above. And what this can result in is, you know, overwhelm and burnout. So we really look at how we can set boundaries in a professional manner that actually helps the other person to find an alternative source of support so that nobody's losing out, but it's very much protecting your own well-being in a professional way. So there's so much that goes into these six week programs and it's very much designed to help women come out the other side of that, feeling empowered to co-create that career path with the organization they're working for. Um, you know, I, I see statistics all the time about people who want to move ahead in their careers, but they want to stay in the organization. But as we alluded to earlier, feel that there just isn't that place for them. I think there was a stat the other day, 82% of people would consider leaving a job if there were no career progression. So it's about people taking responsibility for their own career progression and almost speaking up and saying, this is something that I've identified that I'm really passionate about. How could we look to work this into what I'm doing now or potentially look at something else in the future? So keeping people in the organization so that they can grow with them is something that I'm passionate about as well. So there's all sorts going on. Amazing. Well, again, that links to that communication. Interestingly, I, I don't want to make it about a his, his and her thing here, but something resonated with what you just mentioned, which is, you know, you said women sometimes like to be people pleasers and eventually can get to burnout. And you've talked about within your three pillars, uh, communication being a big, a big area here. So I'm going to take this right down to just my own example without making a generalist statement. But I have a feeling there'll be people listening to this saying, yes, this is true. So with me and my wife as an example, we, we're very much a team. I like to believe we're very much a team in what we do. But there's certainly a communication area here that if I do something, I'm much more um, open about telling her that I've done it. And she will often do the same thing and not mention it because it's just what she does. Do you, yeah. to take that, I, I could use a, a very um, stereotypical version of events. So there's a chore in the house, hoovering, whatever it is. If I've done it, I will tend to go, just so you know, I've done this. She'll have done it, not tell me. I'll, she'll just expect me to notice it's done, maybe, but she won't actually highlight the fact. And there's certainly for me, there's a bit of a celebration that it's been done because I like to take it off my to do list and whatever. To, to, to magnify that example in a different way here, do you feel that only because of what you just mentioned, it may resonate with me, that within that communication thing here, that, that men typically are more open about just telling everyone the achievements they've done and what they've done? And you mentioned the people pleasing word, which came from you, saying, well, as women, do the same work and they work just as isn't that's not not in question it's just they're less vocal about celebrating the fact that they've done it or making it less visible within a business so it can be overlooked i don't know if this is a problem or not i'd love to hear your view but it resonated with me in my own setup here because my wife barely ever tells me what she does what she does because she feels she doesn't need to and i can see that it's been done and even though i know that i still tell her anyway when i've done the same thing does that make sense yeah yeah it's so true it's a really good analogy actually and and to kind of further that analogy you know let's say we're talking about doing the hoovering or whatever you know you'll be saying i've done this and that's great you know your wife maybe may, may not say anything but then over time she's going to be doing different chores every day building on that doing more and more and more and then one day she's going to turn around and say do you know how much i do in this house and become frustrated yeah. because you haven't yeah. noticed and it's similar in the workplace we take on more and more and more and go out of our way to try and further our own development and we don't tell anyone but then we become frustrated because nobody knows. And it's all about that self-advocacy, you know, really being able to say, actually, you know, I'm really pleased that I've done this. Here's examples where I've evidenced this, that, and the other. And without it feeling as though you're boasting, because I get that a yeah. lot. Women say, I don't want to come across as arrogant. Confidence is something that is, you know, it can come across as arrogancy. And it's not about that. It's about stating the facts in a way that can help you to get towards your goal and make sure that you are known for doing that. And you're so right, you know, typically men can be more vocal about their achievements, which puts them in the running for that next roll up. So being able to self-advocate in a way that aligns with your own values as a woman, 
is something that I'm really keen to teach in my programs because it has to feel good to you. I can give you a script and say, you know, say this, but you, you, it's not going to come across in what you actually want to say because you'll feel uncomfortable. So it's about picking different ways of phrasing things or using different structures or tone of voice or pace of speech or whatever in that communication skills element to be able to say something that does the job <laughs> in terms of telling everyone what you've done that feels good to you. Yeah, I think that makes great sense. I feel bad because I used a, a chores, which is a really bad stereotypical example, but it's real <laughs> in my household. I think another one would be my wife has recently published uh, for the work that she does in a, in a publication. Yeah, I did all the promotion. She was like, no, it'll happen organically. And I'm like, no, no, it won't. People won't see this unless you promote it. But I end up doing all the promotion for her because I'm so proud. But it was like, you know, she. it's just, a, it was interesting. And maybe it's a, such a small, um, you know, <laughs> study group of me and my wife here. But it was just how we work. It was quite interesting. And that there's another example there of me wanting to shout about everything she's doing. And she's been quite happy. Yeah. I don't know. No, people will just see it organically. And it's just a different mindset basis. Last question uh, for you today, Rachel, uh, is this. So we've got, we've had 2021 talking about promoting International Women's Day and being focused on women in leadership during COVID-19 times. 2022, we're looking at sustainability and the link there. If you could choose the UN theme for 2023, what would it be for International Women's Day? Oh, that's such a good question, Nick. Um, I think it would definitely be something around communication skills, you know, communicating your way to success because it's a challenge for both individuals and organizations. And the challenge is, is that, you know, it all comes down to perspective. We all think that we're doing things a certain way, that other people receive that in a different way and we can't one thing that we can't ever account for is someone's interpretation of what we've yeah. shared we can never account for that because all of their personal experiences prior to that i.e their mindset is going to interpret that for them so i think that understanding that process and being able to com communicate with people effectively at all levels um, is going to be hugely significant in contributing to greater gender diversity or certainly equality in the future. I think that's a brilliant answer and a great way to round off the podcast. I am going to open the HR L&D vault and I'm really interested in these answers. So some short questions with some short answers because I've seen your journey. I've read about your journey to where you are today, Rachel. So first question is this, in hindsight, what's the one thing you now know that you wish you had known when you began your career? Oh, without a doubt, I wish that I'd learned to value myself earlier on 100% but also understood how my mind worked you know understanding that actually limiting beliefs happen to everyone the way your brain works is normal would have massively helped me to propel myself a lot further along fantastic if you can give one piece of advice to the world to help everyone working in the world of work right now what would it be easy confidence can be learned this is my mantra and so many people just say things like, I'm just not naturally confident, that just doesn't come naturally to me. It can be learned, it's like any other skill and it's something that if we work at and we're committed to, we can learn it. Amazing, fantastic. If you had the opportunity now, what advice would you give a younger self just starting out in the world of work? Um, I would definitely ask them to do a bit of self-reflection and try and understand a what their values are so looking at things that they just don't want to have to um you know they don't want to have to change or alter they want to be able to have a compromise free version of their lives and um, and try and live their life by those values so really bearing them in mind with every decision that they make but also one thing that i always ask um my clients to do when we're doing kind of career coaching and that sort of thing is journaling on their ideal day at work. So what does it look like? What sort of tasks are they doing? Are they working with other people? Are they working with animals? Are they working alone? You know, what does that look like? And I think it really helps people to begin to shape actually what they'd love to do. And even having that idea in mind, even if you're at the beginning of your career and you think, well, great, I've got my ideal day here. How do I make that happen? It doesn't have to be overnight, but by having that clear vision means that you're a lot more likely to be able to build steps to get there towards it rather than somebody who hasn't got that vision. That makes total sense. Fantastic answer. And this last question here, I'm gonna have one question after this specifically for International Women's Day, but before we get there, what's the guiding principle or behavior that you've seen in every a leader that you would consider great that you've worked with? Um, I think integrity. I think that, you know, integrity is so hugely important and 
humility as well because you know being able to be have, have people trust you um, and know that you're going to deliver exactly you know what you've promised is so hugely important because with a lot of leaders I think that if you're in a large organization it can often feel as though they've got their own motives for yeah. delivering to you what they're delivering and it sometimes feels like they can be misaligned with our well-being I know that's personally happened to me, you know, sure. the motives that leaders have had haven't necessarily had my best interests at heart. So being able to kind of display humility and integrity in that way, I think helps to kind of collapse that hierarchical gap between a leader and you. No, well, I love that answer. My answer would be trust. And I think they're pretty closely aligned between trust yeah. and integrity. So um, you've fully had me with that answer. So I fully agree. So last question is this, since National Women's Day, if there was a woman or women in your life that you would particularly like to celebrate today, who would they be and why? Oh, that's a tricky one. I think um, in terms of mentors. Completely up um, to you. I, so I've, I'll choose a mentor in this one for my personal life, actually. A mentor I really admire is Carrie Green, and she's somebody who set up the Female Entrepreneur Association and somebody who has so many guiding principles throughout the work that they do that resonate with just everyday people that have the same struggles. And by being such a relatable leader, um, I would definitely want to celebrate her. Um, and someone for my personal life, I would say my sister. My sister is called Thea and she is somebody who always believes in me no matter what I'm doing. There's just no question um, in anything that I do that I won't achieve it. And I think sometimes she believes in, in me more than I do myself. It's like, it's like I'm going to say, you know, that something that happens every day, I don't know, that the sun's going to come up. It's like, all right, yeah, you're going to do it. Um, and so I would massively celebrate her and, and encourage her to believe in herself in the same way as well. Fantastic. Well, in a minute, we're going to find out exactly where we can find out more about you. But I'm going to take the opportunity because it is International Women's Day to give a shout out to the one inspiration in my life as well, who is a woman, which is my mother, who, despite being homeless at 15, is now is now a CEO. So is one of those great statistics of CEO of her own company, which is the largest baby franchise in the UK. It's actually in 28 countries now as well. Um, she went back as a mature student at university in her 40s, now has a PhD. So she did all of her education later, despite being told she'd probably never amount to anything. Um, so I have an opportunity to say a shout out to her because she inspires me every day. And, um, and it's a great opportunity to do so. So some fantastic women out there doing some some great work. And if we can't celebrate it at the end of a podcast, then you never can, right? So that was my last shout out Absolutely. That is such an inspirational story. And I think that we should be celebrating, you know, we should be celebrating everything that people are doing in their day-to-day -day lives and looking at not only celebrating those people but looking at how we can support other people to achieve the same or, or different results that they would want absolutely agree so for those that are listening to this right now they want to find out more they want to maybe engage in your amazing coaching courses and by the way it's a fantastic website there's blogs there's about me there's you can book in for for some direct chats and bits and pieces and the link will be in the show notes which is rachelharriotcoaching.co.uk um, so I'll put that link in the episode notes. Are there any other particular links that you'd like to highlight today, uh, Rachel, for our audience? Um, so within the website, there is a corporate coaching section, which has a bit more information about my six week program that we've talked about today. So definitely check that out um, and see if that resonates. Um, also, please do connect with me on LinkedIn. You know, I'm always looking to gain new perspectives about challenges that people are facing and look at how I can continue to tailor my my options for courses to make it as relevant as possible for people. So definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Rachel Gilfrin. Um, and of course, the spelling of the name will all be in the show notes. So you don't have to be thinking, what on earth is that name, which I often get as well. So that's great. Um, and finally, as well, I do have a podcast myself, um, which is called the Achieve With Me podcast. And that's very much um, aimed towards women who are career focused and want to build their confidence and communication skills. So lots of exciting topics covered there. Amazing. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure all of those links from the show notes. If you are listening to this now and you want to find out or link in directly with Rachel, go to the show notes. You can link in directly. I'll also include your Instagram um, uh, handle as well uh, there, Rachel, for those that want to follow you on Instagram. And of course, if you are an HR or L&D leader listening to this podcast, you need support with an HR or L&D related vacancy. Do give myself or any of my amazing team a call. Uh, you can get access us at jgarecruitment.com. Just leads me to say, I hope you're all celebrating a wonderful International Women's Day today. Please make sure you let all the women in your life know that you want to celebrate their successes and what they've done for you, if they've inspired you in any way. And I uh, just want to say a huge thank you to Rachel for joining me today. 
Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a fantastic way to celebrate a great day. So thanks, Nick. My pleasure. I look forward to being the next episode. We'll see.